So Manuel Lima, uh, did I pronounce that well? Yeah, perfectly. Yeah. Okay. Perfectly. Okay. So <laughs> Manuel Lima, welcome to CST. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thanks for having me. So we are. Uh, this is the weird segment of uh, CST. This is the time in a week where we talk to an author of maybe a book, maybe a website, maybe this, which is. Not exactly a book. I think it's something beyond that because not only because it's awesome, but because yeah. it mixes science, history, technology, a lot of stuff. Can you tell me a little bit about what this is in your own work? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think it's first of all, it's a, it's a book in the in a sort of physical format. But I think it's also like, a, as you say, I think it's also an archive for the future, uh, an archive in the sense that well, not only am I retrieving a lot of old examples of, you know, in this particular case of tree diagrams, but also a lot of new ones that unfortunately tend to disappear. You know, tree diagrams that have been created in the last decade alone, a lot of them in digital form, formats, that those unfortunately tend to vanish uh, at some point. Hmm. Which is, so this becomes even more of an urgent sort of mission to create an archive for future generations. Because unfortunately, this is something I found out even in my first book, Visual Complexity which was when I was trying to gather a lot of these projects, a lot of, a lot of them were like uh, removed from the server, the plugin was not working anymore, uh, the code was outdated, and a lot of these are really important cultural artifacts that are, you know, we are being lost mm -hmm. every single day. A lot of these projects are just disappearing, right? So, so you're is, trying to, to build an archive to salvage a, a lot of digital things, yes, but, but this, is, this is a thread, this is a history that you can go back centuries. Yes, yes. How, how does this idea of using the tree as a metaphor for data yes. uh, begins? Well, it begins really like, I think it, it goes back to the, the, the core of like our ability to like represent information, right? And I think this, the, the, the metaphor of the tree, the visual metaphor of the tree has been adopted because it's, it's perhaps one of the most pervasive metaphors and symbols that you can find across the world, across time, across space. Uh, it, I think the genesis of this sort of fascination with trees uh, goes back to you know when the, a time when we were not surrounded by asphalt, by glass, by iron as you see around us. Uh, trees were essential for our survival, right? Trees right. were providers of shelter, of food, of weaponry, of any type of resources you can think of. Trees were providers, right? They were essential for our survival, for the survival of our species. And then, for that particular reason, it was just a matter of time that trees were also seen as sort of celestial beings, almost very sort of important religious symbols. There's hardly any religion across the world that doesn't revere some type of tree. You have sacred trees or trees of life going back to ancient Babylon, going back to ancient Egypt, ancient Greece, believed in a, a few uh, trees. Of course, all the three main religions, you know, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism also believe in some type of sacred tree, the tree of life that lives in paradise and so on. And from that point on, you can see how, how pervasive the tree as a symbol became. And it was just a matter of time before they, become, they went from religious symbols into important classification systems to right. map different systems of, of, of thought, different sort of areas of knowledge and domains of knowledge for, for us humans. So they became important communication tools, mostly, right, right to convey some type of of the main some type of, of information. Well, one of the most striking things about this book that I, I think that I never paused before to sort of ponder, to wonder about, is that uh, you could actually design a, a lot of different trees with information and they convey the information in a very different and definite yes. way. Yes. Uh, just Shoot me, you know, three examples about vertical, horizontal. Oh, yeah, I mean, the, so I think the book Talk, I mean, all the chapters are different methodologies of working with trees, right? So you can have a vertical tree. Well, the, main, the two main categories are, by far, node-link diagrams. You know, the, those that are created, those go back to like the, the genesis of what a tree represents, right? You normally have a root, and then you have a series of branches, which are lines, can be abstractly represented as a line. And then you have leaves or nodes or fruits, right? They're like little circles in an abstract sense. Those are one category, and those you have vertical trees, you have horizontal trees, you have radial trees that come from the center and then explode towards the periphery. And then the second group is more like space filling diagrams. Those are more advanced in many ways. Those are not normally people would not associate those with trees, uh, but they are still trees in the sense that they represent a root expanding outwards, right? right. In the sense that they represent a hierarchical system of sorts. Mm -hmm. 
But those are a little bit more advanced, especially because they have been developed more recently in the past you know, a couple of centuries only, while the other ones have been going on, as the book explains and shows, for many, 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 many centuries. Uh, do you have a, a favorite illustration of a tree oh, in your book? that's really hard. Uh, I think, so just before we started, we were talking about Brahman Lul. I don't think it's my favorite, but I think it's perhaps, if I was to say the most influential tree diagram would have been probably two ones, actually two uh, uh, diagrams, was probably the one uh, created based on the work of Aristotle, the one that creates so this idea that organization, that, that the knowledge can be organized as a tree. That really changed everything. Mm -hmm. That really changed the paradigm of how we think about the world around us. And then I think Ramon Lul, the work of Spanish scholar Ramon Lul, or should I say Catalan scholar Ramon Lul, was immensely important. He created this amazing book called uh, The Tree of Science, and he was the first one that created this idea uh, that science, or knowledge known at the time, was organized as a tree with different branches. And we use this metaphor even now, nowadays, when we say genetics is a branch of science, when we say the root of a problem. All of that, those simple metaphors that we don't even pay attention to, are due to the work of Ramon Lul, uh, which influenced Descartes, it influenced Leibniz in, in, many, of, in many different ways. So Ramon Lul was perhaps the forefather of this, this idea that knowledge is organized as a tree. What's impressive is how long that metaphor prevailed throughout centuries, which for me is still, I think, one of the most powerful things about trees. And the reason why I wanted to do this book is really how trees are one, not just one of the most powerful tool, communication tools, but also the most universal and long-lasting sort of visual metaphor. You know, it, it lasts more than, than a thousand years, which is really impressive. There's not a lot of things you can think of that really last that long. You know, it resists you know, the, the, the rise and fall of empires, of many different wars, and it's still gone going. It's still going. Like the first chapter on, on figurative trees alone, I think the first one is from, the first diagram is from 1202, which is like pretty old. <laughs> and this, the most recent one is from, I think, 2012. Which is, which is to say, again, the, the, the spectrum of, of Yeah, the creation. span is... Yes, yes. The span is incredible. It's really incredible. Okay. Yeah. Let me ask you now yeah. the following. Um, sure. this, is, this is a book about a way of conveying data, huge yes. amounts of data. Yes. Uh, this, is, this is sort of a, a, a translation tool where you can pick up heaps of data and, and transform them, make them more easily into what? Is it knowledge, as you were saying? Yeah. Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, it, it's not every type of data because I have, every type of data is not hierarchical in nature, right? So there's data that's like relational, there's like different types of data in many ways. But the data that somehow represents some sort of hierarchy in the sense that there is a source, there is a child, there is, well, a root, and then there's dependencies, right? It's like a data that's like dependent. Some elements are dependent on others. It creates this hierarchical system. For those types of, of data sets, Trees is definitely a great way to translate, you know, somehow meaningless raw data into something that's visible, that's insightful, that you can extract immediately patterns out of that data. You can understand how many childs does a good given node has, all of those, like how many sub-levels does it have. So you can really understand the hierarchy. So that's what, you know, perhaps for people to, that are not really understanding what I'm saying, the most obvious case is families, you know, like we have been mapping families or blood ties between people using the tree metaphor for many, many, many centuries because it's the most obvious of all, right? And it has been used also to map systems of law, you know, how certain sort of decrees are dependent on other decrees which are also dependent on that. So this is it's like a tree of dependencies. Right. It has also been mapped to visualize species. As you know, like species, biological species are organized in a very hierarchical way. There's like a species and a subspecies, a sub subspecies, and so on and so on. So trees are being used recurrently to map this kind of system. Uh, and there's many more, more cases where trees are used to translate these sort of uh, data sets. I want to bring the discussion to sort of right now, today. Sure. Um, one of the things that I think is really interesting about the work is that more and more with, you know, the usual suspects. Yes. If maybe Twitter or Facebook or maybe Googling all day long or maybe we live so much so uh, surrounded by data intensive uh, experiences that, that I think that uh, being able to visualize and moreover being able to understand when somebody has crafted data in a visual attractive way so as to influence you in mm. a better oh, way absolutely. or whatever way but 
I think it's really important to, to get acquaintance with the craft. And, and this is a beautiful way of sort of understanding more sort of behind the scenes, if mm -hmm. I may put yeah. it this way. Um, what do you think is that important for a regular citizen? So somebody that's not actually in your field. Um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a hard question. I mean, I think, I think even for a regular citizen, there's a lot of knowledge that can come from that. Just curiosity, like just different systems that have been mapped that probably the regular citizen is not aware of. But I think for the regular citizens, the, the importance of visualization is how it can actually change behavior inevitably. So that's, yeah, I mean, so a lot of that information is like, we tend to be very passive. Like even, you know, we look at the, you know, we look at the news right, right now and we look at how things are, you know, just everything that's happening around us, like all the tragedies, all the wars, everything that else. And we tend to like look away, which is, you know, it's too far from us. We don't really relate to that. But I think visualization has also like that sort of emotional impact that really brings you back to sort of the reality. In many ways, I think, and this is like someone that is involved in the field that usually says that I think the work that we do as information visualizers, in many ways, are the photojournalists of the next century. What I mean by that is like, you know, photojournalism is a great thing, right? In our photo, in just a single photo, can express so much emotion, so much impact that it really makes you think about what's happening in a given situation. And I think a lot of the new subjects we're dealing, talking about big data, a lot of these huge data sets, are not really very clear. You know, you cannot even take a photo of those systems, right? They are really intricate and very complex. So visualizations of those data sets are almost like a different way, an alternative way of doing journalism for you to really understand what's happening behind those systems. That for the regular system, uh, for the regular citizen, it would be impossible to discern. So visualization is more and more becoming also at the same time a, a journalistic tool that can help this, the normal citizen understand what lies behind a lot of these complex sort of you know, data-driven systems. And, and then for a final and an extra, yeah. I know this won't be in the interview, but <laughs> the final edit, but I need to, I need to ask you. Uh, yeah. One of the funniest things when I, when I was you know, leafing through yeah. uh, the book was that um, most metaphors uh, are, of course, of the obvious part of the tree. Yes. So most tree representations are actually half of the story. Uh, because historically we've known trees as the stuff that pops out of the sure, ground, sure, right? Sure, sure. And that was, I, I know that's almost dumb what I'm saying, yeah. but it was really interesting that we assumed that a tree being the cultural idea of a tree, so a root and yes. stuff coming out of a tree, yes. whereas a tree is pretty much the opposite, right? It's, sure, it's, sure. it's, uh, it's sure. a seed where, where two structures, yes. two branching structures yeah. come out of. And that was really uh, shocking. Um, I, I, again, yeah. th that was shocking just because I never thought of it. Uh, yeah. But this is fundamentally not a tree. <laughs> this is a tree. Yes. But that's it. That's yeah. pretty much about no, it. No, this no, is just two or three examples. Of and, and there's even like other examples, like vertical trees, for instance. They actually, most vertical trees are actually inverted trees where the root actually starts on the top, right? right? And actually, the reason why they did that in, in back in the time was that a lot of those representations were part of like long parchment scrolls. So as you scroll, as you unfold the paper, you need to understand what the root is first, right? If the root was on the bottom, you wouldn't get you would get to the root in the end, which is, would not make any sense, right. right? So that's why the root normally is on the top, so that as you unfold the scroll, you start seeing all, all of the different dependencies, right? So that's like a fold out. When yeah, you have exactly, a fold out, exactly. and you don't precisely. You have to start with the root because that's the the, the it's, it's the overall context of the tree. Without the root, we don't understand the origin. Right. Uh, everything doesn't make any sense if you start from like the, the last sort of element. Sure, right? sure, sure. But yeah. <laughs> That's really cool. Yeah. Manuel, thank you very much yeah, for your time. Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks a lot.